Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we're starting today's panel discussion. So welcome to Unitalized Panel Discussion Chapter 2, uh, where we're going to be talking about how should you go about deciding the right country when applying for your undergraduate degree. So I'm your moderator. My name is Vishesh. Uh, I'm a fourth year student studying at the University of California in Davis, pursuing economics and management. And without further ado, let's meet our panelists. So first we have Hrithik Khurana uh, from York University in Canada. Uh, Hrithik, I really request you to introduce yourself. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Vishesh. Um, so um, I hope you guys can hear me properly, but um, I'm, a I'm a finance major and I recently just graduated from York University. And um, as you can see, I've always been involved in a lot of academics and sports throughout my life. So I think that played a huge part in my college application as well and deciding which college I want to go to as well. And um, other than that, um, I held a lot of student club positions um, at my university. And I think after that, um, I'm, I'm starting work, I think, next week. So I think uh, it's been a full cycle and I'm starting a I guess, new chapter in my life next week. So that's about me. Uh, thank you, Rutik. Next, we have Mac from NTU in Singapore. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mac, and I'm currently a final year student at NTU with a major in computer science and a minor in public policy and global affairs. Um, I've been a mentor at Unit Alive for almost two years now. Um, something about me is that I recently just finished my internship at the Straits Times which is Singapore's national newspaper. So that was a really interesting experience for me, uh, which, which I got through my university. So I'll be talking more about how I applied, what's what's important and everything later on. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Mac. Next, we have Chaitanya from UIUC in the US. Hi, everyone. I'm Chaitanya. I'm a rising senior at UIUC, pursuing a dual degree in systems engineering and design and technology entrepreneurship. I mainly uh, applied to countries uh, America and one place in Canada. And the reason was I wanted a flexible program because while going in, I knew like I liked engineering. Uh, I wasn't really certain what kind and I wanted that flexibility which those countries offered. So that's why I chose those places. And one thing that I think was uh, a part of like my application in general was uh, just being really involved in extracurriculars throughout high school and, you know, just showing that I'm, I'm involved outside of classes as well, I think. And that's something I've continued going into U of I. Thank you, Chaitanya. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Ratna Aditya from UCL in the UK. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ratna Aditya. I'm currently studying at UCL. I'm pursuing a Bachelor of Sciences in politics and international relations, along with British parliamentary studies and European integrationist theories. Um, I have previously worked with a number of think tanks, both in India, as well as the EU. Uh, I've been a young thinker for the European Commission. And yes, my interests essentially range from military studies to policy and policy analysis. Um, when it comes to applying to countries, I applied to the UK, Canada, and the Netherlands. Uh, thank you, Ratna. So uh, finally, moving on to our today's topics of discussion. And if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat box uh, and I'll be bringing, up, uh, bringing those up with our uh, panelists or wait towards the end where you can have like a one-on-one -on -one chat with a panelist. Uh, finally, I think we've all introduced ourselves. Uh, Chaitanya, I'm putting you on spot here. Could you briefly talk about your admission story? Uh, you know, what worked for you? What did not work for you while applying to the US? Uh, definitely. So I think it what it really starts with is um, choosing and like making a list of uh, you know the places. Once once obviously you've narrowed down the countries you want to go to. So uh, you know looking at the discussion uh, topic today, I think it would be first ideal to talk about why I chose, as I briefly mentioned earlier, why I chose America and Canada was primarily because of the flexibility they offered and knowing my own uh, just wide area of interest that I hope the university would help me sort of filter down uh, these countries felt like the right mix for me and specifically America because I also knew I was really interested in entrepreneurship and that's something I've been actively pursuing so uh, these places have uh, you know provided me the opportunities uh, I thought would provide me the opportunity so that's why I applied there and when it came to the universities 
what really helped was uh, looking at things like, uh, you know, what's the rate of uh, return on an education in one of these universities, factors like what, you know, when it comes to engineering as well, I was looking for programs, which, uh, which uh, the one I'm doing like systems engineering, it sort of helps me uh, get a good strong base uh, in major engineering disciplines while getting the opportunity to choose what I really like and then going deep down it. So it kind of gives like a T-shaped uh, uh, perspective into engineering. So that's, I was looking for universities that really offered that. So places like University of Pennsylvania, University of Illinois, uh, they were, you know, the bigger choices for me. So how I really went on from there was uh, trying to identify what really worked for people who've applied before. So, you know, uh, things like Unilad really come in handy where, you know, they connect you with people who are already studying there. Uh, so stuff like this, basically connect with people who've done it. So trying to understand how it works. And then uh, also, you know, just being very critical about what my pros and cons are, stuff like that. Is there anything I've missed out, Vishesh, that uh, uh, no, we should talk about here? Uh, no, I think you pretty much covered everything. I, I would just like to add, so the concept of returns, I would say would also go monetarily. I mean, you know, you always look at the return on investment ratio as well when it comes to how much you're investing in your education and how quickly can you earn that back. Unless and until you're looking to get into, you know, master's, PhD and looking for funding. So uh, I think you pretty much were spot on, Piranha. Thank you so much. Uh, Mac, I know you did apply uh, to a lot of uh, countries in Asia as well. So, I mean, and, and I know you applied to US as well. Why did you uh, finally choose NTU in Singapore? Why not a university in the US? Okay. Um, so my application process actually was quite lengthy because I've gone through it twice. Um, so the first time I applied, I was supposed to go to the UK. I was uh, going to start studying at the University of Warwick, but um, due to like a personal emergency, I had to delay my studies and I took a gap year. So I did an internship. I took up personal projects and that's when I kind of realized that computer science is something that I really want to do. And um, I again applied to a lot of universities in the US, UK, um, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong. So um, what made me actually choose Asia was uh, because um, Singapore is kind of like a rising technological hub and a major business hub. So I felt that since it's also kind of close to home as well, I uh, picked Singapore. Uh, but other than that, I feel um, why I really chose it was because of um, the standard of the academics offered by NTU. Um, the opportunities offered over here, as well as um, the safety and just the general um, environment of the country. So I felt like I kind of went with my gut rather than uh, doing like a major pros and cons list. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Mac. Just another question for you, a uh, follow-up yeah. question. So uh, do you think you're missing out on something? I know computer science as a major is really big in the US and West Coast. You have a lot of startups popping up. So do you okay. think you're missing on something in Singapore that you could have done better if you went to US? Or do you think NTU offers everything? Okay, uh, so that's actually a great question and I get asked about it all the time. So um, I have a lot of friends who are studying in the US and they're also doing computer science. So I feel like um, Singapore is quite on par with Silicon Valley and other major cities. Um, I guess, uh, Singapore can be considered as a more affordable option for education. So I feel that kind of also plays in, uh, that kind of also plays a role in that. Um, but otherwise, the startup scene is also really great over here in Singapore. It's, um, nice. so the government itself. Um, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I also feel like um, the government itself is investing a lot in uh, innovative ideas in a lot of hackathons and a lot of um, AI based startups. So I feel like um, there's no dearth of opportunity here as well. And Singapore is very well connected to the rest of the world. So it's um, actually a major hub. And I feel like it's, it's a great place to be based out of. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Mac. Uh, Ratna, moving on to you. Uh, I know you did apply to Canada as well. So, uh, and a few other countries in the Europe. So why UK? Why did you finally, uh, you know, choose UK other than Canada? Because I know Canada does offer PR and that's very lucrative for a lot of people. Um, so I think the primary reason why I chose the UK was um, actually there are two reasons. The first is that the, the nature of what I wanted to study. I wanted to do politics and international relations, but um, I wanted 
they do it somewhere abroad as well as keep one foot in india right and india and the uk had a very similar parliamentary system right at the end of the day we've adopted, adopted it from the uk um so that was one of the reasons i wanted to study in a very similar and similar environment something that i could study and then come back and implement um at the same time it was where i was studying um there were three universities king's college london uh, St. Andrews and UCL. Now, UCL had originally rejected me and they sent me an offer one month before I was supposed to start. Um, so I was actually set on going to St. Andrews. And um, I chose those three because of the professors that were going to be teaching me and the subjects that they were offering. Uh, I wouldn't be able to study European integration theories in Canada. And um, I wouldn't be, if I would, then I wouldn't get the same insight as what I would get in Europe. And um, that's also one of the reasons why I applied to the Netherlands because um, I applied to Leiden, which is at The Hague and is directly connected to the International Court of Justice, the ICJ. And um, so I essentially what I did is I charted out a plan for myself, which looked, which was essentially a four year plan that where I want to be, where I am today and where I want to be there. And these two countries just fitted better than what Canada could offer me at that time. Right. And actually, that's a very great insight because, you know, usually people tend to lean towards, okay, this country is offering me PR, this country is offering me an immediate job after my undergraduation. And you tend to, uh, you like, kind of lean towards more as to what I can learn from where, like, for example, what you're learning in the UK, you can't learn in Canada because, as you said, the parliamentary system is, is quite similar to India. So I'm assuming you want to come back to India after your undergraduation or uh, would you probably, you know, stick to the UK? No, so for a long time, I always had it in my mind that even if I do settle abroad, I want to do something which is Asian politics related, right? And um, I always thought that with the given scenario where you have countries like China and India bursting onto the international scene, you must be aware of what caliber they have, right? And there was only one way that I could do it, by keeping, as I said, keeping one foot in India while I'm still abroad, you know? So therefore, if you see, I've been working with Center for Land Warfare in New Delhi, Right, because um, that's one way of just keeping in touch with what you want to actually study. Right, uh, thank you, Ratna. Uh, Hrithvik, last question for you. Uh, I know you applied to both the US and Canada. Why did you finally choose Canada over the US? Right, that's, yeah, that's a great question. So I think um, my, my story is similar to Max, I think. Um, I actually applied to, I wanted to go to Kelly School of Business at Indiana. I got accepted, I was gonna start I think in two months and then I was going to start in four months actually and then after that um, I got a better offer from York University and um, I so not only I wanted to study I also wanted to pursue football as well so I applied for um, varsity sports related scholarships and everything and I actually got a really good varsity scholarship here at York and I pursued that at my first year and I couldn't after because I got injured and I couldn't continue playing after but um, yeah, I had to, um, I think, change my plans um, after my first year here at, here, here at York. And um, I think that was one of the biggest reasons because um, also I think education is more affordable in Canada. And I think there's a better chance for you. I think if, let's say, if I wanted to study in the US, or I wanted to work in the US after a certain number of years, I could do that because it's in really close proximity. And there's a lot of uh, companies that have offices, both in Canada and the US, which are connected and work together. I think um, that was my reasoning, I think, um, in terms of choosing Canada, because if, even if I wanted to work in the U.S. later, I could do that easily. Right. So basically, it's like a back entry to the U.S. Uh, where you're looking, like where you're seeing your final end goal to be. Right. I mean, right. Not, right. Okay. I think, yeah, I just see it as a backup option because I like backup options, but I think everything. So um, in case things don't work in Canada, there's always an option to um, go to the U.S. Right. And, and I mean, you already have a Canadian passport, I think, within your uh, five years of living there in Canada, if I'm not wrong. So, so I've lived here for four years and I don't have a Canadian passport right now. I would, after my, after I stop my full-time employment for one year, that's when I can apply for my PR. And um, that also makes education affordable in terms of, uh, because I want to pursue a master's after, so I think I can pay a domestic tuition fee. Um, and that's also a huge part, I think, in right. terms of applying for Canada. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, moving on to the next set of questions. I think we've already answered a lot of these. Um, I'd like to put Chaitanya on spot and uh, Chaitanya, what do you think uh, was very important? Like what is one thing that's stood out in your entire application uh, while applying to the US? And what do you think was your reason for you getting into UIUC? Uh, definitely. So I think, uh, you know, just talking about uh, what I mentioned earlier with my 
uh, sort of focus on uh, entrepreneurship and engineering's intersection. I think that's something I really took as a center theme, even when I was applying and uh, for specifically for UIUC, like I had uh, uh, doubt of um, like entrepreneurship work, even through high school, like I had, I had already been developing a startup uh, through my days at high school. And then basically uh, before that I had even done like a summer school at the Wharton School of Business uh, on focus on entrepreneurship. So I think those kind of experiences sort of uh, provided me with a different angle. And outside of that, I even uh, like tried to basically work with some established entrepreneurs in India and try to gather like, you know, what kind of work they've been up to. So uh, develop some reports on that. So basically clubbed uh, that engineering interest uh, and its intersection with technology through entrepreneurship to show my interest. And outside of that, the other thing that I really used was uh, my sort of involvement in anything math that was happening in school, because uh, I think for an, any engineering program, uh, they really like to see good STEM scores. So showing a lot of involvement with the math department, I was the, uh, I, I had been working with the school math magazine for like four years up, and then becoming the editor in chief and then starting a couple of initiatives there as well. So I think clubbing, uh, taking that publication from like uh, a, a good standing in the, you know, in, in the school to like actually transforming how it worked internally to improving our sort of attendance rate by like 10x. I think that really helped show uh, not just like that I, I could uh, think about entrepreneurial ideas to start one, but also like that, uh, you know, I had the grit to make some some change, I think. And that's something Yoga I really cares about because uh, you know, just being a good engineering school that I think that's something that all engineering school cares about, but I think that is something that definitely helped me with your and I ended up choosing your over the other places I got in because of the high return on investment, as I mentioned, and, uh, the track record they had with startups, you know, Tesla, YouTube, they all came out of, uh, PayPal, they all came out of your So it really, uh, prompted me to choose, uh, that university. Right. Thank you, Chaitanya. So, uh, so in a nutshell, basically major related activities. So whatever uh, major you were applying for activities revolving around those and uh, brief mentions of those activities in your essays kind of stood out. You think that's what helped? Uh, Definitely. I think uh, a big, uh, you know, thing people are confused about when applying to programs is that, you know, they, they choose a certain program uh, and then they think, okay, we got to do like a lot of extracurricular, especially for like US, that's something people think, okay, we got to get involved in everything. But that's not how it works. So what they really want to see is that you've chosen the areas, you know, very thoughtfully and you've really doing those things and that work that you did in those category or those uh, sort of topics is what really led you to choosing that kind of a degree. So it's all it all needs to be funneled down from like broad areas of interest to a lot of involvement in some, and then finally pursuing a major in that specific section. It can't be like you're applying for engineering and then, uh, you know, being uh, spending all your time at like month conferences because that doesn't align that well, right? So you got to really think through those things. Right. Uh, thank you, Chaitanya. Uh, Mac, uh, do you think you made the right decision while choosing uh, NTU or you think you'd, if you could go back in time, you could still trade off with a better U.S. university. Okay, uh, so I definitely feel like I've made the right choice. I'm very happy at NTU with the kind of standard that they uh, are supposed to give. I am getting that. Um, the professors are really good, very helpful, very friendly. Um, so the thing is, I personally feel that one thing um, that I found to be very helpful over here is that people go out of their way to help you. Um, it's not a very cutthroat or a competitive environment. So it's a very collaborative environment and that's what people promote over here. So uh, whether it's like fellow peers or if it's like seniors or your professors or mentors or any anybody in the university actually. So they would just uh, try and help you in whatever way. Like if you go and talk to them and network with them, they kind of help you uh, in like getting opportunities or telling you that, oh, there's this program, why don't you apply for it? So I feel like, uh, that kind of a, a collaborative environment is something that um, I, I, I feel like was the best part of NTU. Um, again, I feel like Singapore is one of the best places to be in because it is 
very very safe very convenient and it's it's a very small country as well so uh, public transport is very quick as well so i feel like th there are just minor conveniences that kind of like push singapore up there and um there are all, all the major companies are over here they have their headquarters their asia headquarters over here in singapore so i feel like that also adds on to the whole um uh tech hub uh, of Asia. So I feel, yeah, I, I feel that I made the right decision. Um, otherwise, uh, while talking about what's really important for Singapore, um, I think the single most thing is uh, your 12th grade marks. So that's, that's kind of where uh, it uh, draws the line. So uh, Singapore, uh, NTU really had a high cutoff for computer science. So I think my grades really help to get in. Uh, but I also applied to the Singapore University of Technology and Design, uh, which is um, another tech-based university here. So they kind of value all the extracurriculars and uh, what, what you do uh, in, in high school. So I did uh, have an interview with them as well. So told them about uh, what personal projects I pursued and my internship experience. So, so I think all of that played in and um, so to, to give you a bit more uh, insight into what I actually did during my internship. So I worked uh, with a cybersecurity company and I was uh, just uh, hired as an intern who would just help out with almost anything and everything. So uh, it, was, it was quite uh, insightful because uh, I was made to do uh, technical presentations. I was also involved in uh, actually observing the team uh, when they're facing an attack and how they're supposed to defend. So I'm not, I'm not very well versed with that yet, but, but that requires a lot of efforts. So I think that that kind of exposure and observation kind of helped me. And I, I kind of embedded those into my uh, essays and that's kind of what helped me to get admission over here. So, yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Mac. Uh, Ratna, moving on to you. Uh, I think you had a, you got a 95 point, uh, 6% in your 12th boards, if I'm not wrong. So how important do you think are grades while applying to UK, like especially your 12th grades? Um, I would say that they're probably the most, most important thing while you're applying to the UK. Um, which, because I'll tell you why, uh, in terms of UCL, um, this is the first year that they are actually offering politics and international relations, right? So they had, they in my batch, you know, they only took in 30 people. Right. Whereas like, let's take the economics batch, they have 900 people there. Right. So, you know, it was, you had for sure, you had a number of applicants, a large number of applicants coming in. And obviously every single person had something on their CV, which, you know, made them stand out. Right. But at the end of the day, everything boiled down to the grades who scored the most. Right. And as I mentioned it earlier, um, I didn't get an offer from UCL as well. Right. They rejected me and they offered me to study Slavic studies and Russian history. And I was wanting to study politics. So I gave up on UCL and finalized St. Andrews. And then one month before I'm going to St. Andrews, they say that, you know, we've reconsidered and there's one or two places more. So we'd like you to come to UCL, right? So when I spoke to my course director, they said they, they were talking to me about, about it. And they said that we boiled it down to everyone's grade to the end, right? And I'm sure that the same goes for universities like LSC, Kings, um, St. Andrews, SOAS, right? Those are the ones that I applied to. Um, just another thing, your 12th standard grades um, are important. Yes, for sure. 11th is also very important, right? And um, I don't know if you guys are aware of the fact that there's something known as predicted grades, right? And I think that the pred predicted grades settle everything for you because at the end of the day, you're going to get your unconditional of sorry, conditional offer based on your predicted grades, right? And UCL wanted me to get a 95% and I luckily got a 95.6. So I, it's, it, grades are very important at the end of the day. Uh, thank you, Ratna. So now, I mean, you know, again, putting you on spot from a counselor perspective, would you suggest students applying for economics because there are 900 acceptances for economics over applying to political science? So, I mean, at least to your university, what, what do you reckon? You know, so um, that, that is a very interesting question, to be very honest. Um, see, I'm going to be very honest with you. Um, I have always felt that it really depends on what you want to study, right? Um, it really shouldn't matter that, you know, there are a thousand people or there are 10 people at a course, right? At the end of the day, if you yourself know that, you know, I am going to be able to 
deliver a certain grade or i am going to be able to you know and yeah keep in mind that what it is getting into university is one thing and surviving the next four years is also very important right because at the end of the day you know um you're going to be away from home you know you're going to be paying a lot so at the end of the, so it, it is important that you deliver at all fronts right so if you feel that you can do better at politics go ahead and apply for politics right but if you feel that you can do better probably the best in economics with 900 or 899 more people around you then go ahead and apply for economics right because at the end of the day everything's just going to boil down to you and how you are able to absorb content and deliver on, on deliver at every front so so is it easy for you to change your major in uk so for example let's say i applied for economics and then i want to transition into political science and international relations because that's my area of interest is, is it easy or is it difficult no so i unlike the us you cannot change uh, your course uh, however there are uh, common modules so the reason why essentially you can't change your course is because there are different departments right each department is run and operated differently as but there are common modules so there might be some economic modules that you will be able to do uh, very one very simple example is i study politics and ir right but i do a lot of quantitative analysis qualitative analysis coding um i do um, you know so so i look at how social problems for example can be solved using economics right um, because there are two reasons for that common modules and second mine is not a bachelor of arts mine is a bachelor of sciences in politics and ir right so you have to be very very careful while you choose your course and that then that is why i would suggest that before you make a final decision go through the modules go through the professors who are going to be teaching you see what other course they are teaching you because there's a high probability that they might incorporate content from there into your course right uh, thank you ratan that was very insightful i mean uh, building on uh, that question rithik i know in the us it's very easy for you to change majors within a particular school so let's say if i'm in college of arts and sciences it is very easy for me to change one major from one major to another it is a little difficult for me to let's say jump colleges if i'm in school of engineering and i want to do economics in school of business it is possible uh, but it, but it's difficult even in the us uh, how about in canada what's the situation like in canada when it com- comes to transitioning from majors right um so yeah that's a good question because i actually did change my major in my second year um uh, i was studying uh, marketing first and i thought this isn't the right fit for me because um i really wanted to do something with numbers because i've always liked math and i've always like um um like analytical roles i think so i think that's why i switched to finance and i think um i don't think it was difficult for me to change majors just because it was offered in the same program so my degree actually offers six majors so you can change in my degree you can change into a different major before your third year so um i think it was easy in terms of that but i think in terms of um changing your program altogether um it's not that difficult but um the only re- thing is that there's some prerequisite courses that you have to take so for example that if if in your grade 12 you did um if you took commerce and if you wanted to change into a program let's say um that involves science any kind of sciences i think here so i think you would have to take some prerequisite courses at york first it, like first year courses and only then you'll be eligible to actually apply for your transition so it's not difficult but it's just that you have to meet those prerequisites before you actually apply for that program i see uh, thank you rithik uh, we have a few questions in the chat box so i'd like to uh, take a few minutes asking our panelists those questions uh, which is, so and any one of you can take it hands on which is the best country to become a doctor or study medical sciences uh this uh any one of you want to speak about that or uh, okay ratna go for it um i mean it really depends on where you want to practice right because um i have a few friends who are studying medical and for um for example in the uk you need to pass an exam which grants you a license to practice in the uk um and there are different licenses for example there's a license for a surgeon there's a license for a nurse right at the same time i think that goes for the same with the us if you have to become a resident at a certain hospital you have to have a license and set, um clear a few exams and so it really uh, my answer would be that it really depends on where you want to you know practice depending on various other factors Uh, right and just building on that for us and canada it's not all, medicine is not offered at an undergraduate degree so once you're done with your four years of undergraduate that's when you apply to med school after uh, taking an exam which i think i'm forgetting i think it's mcat if i'm not wrong after which you finish your med school give your us mle before uh, that you can't even start practicing so you are looking at a good 400 to 500000 investment before even before you have started your medical practices and that's a huge investment i would rather suggest 
you just stick to india or probably like russia china or some other countries offering it for cheap and then doing a specialization at a more uh, advanced country uh, uh chetanya would you want to speak a little on that or uh, do you think i covered pretty much everything for the us in terms of medicine yeah i think that's pretty much how it's, it is like with the pre med program uh, i think there's four more added years of uh you know going through like education that's not primarily focused towards your medical degree so i think uh, a, a lot of the, uh, options are there to you know get through this path so i've heard a couple people go to uh the caribbean islands and there are some universities in the caribbean islands which are accredited in america so you could study there and then basically get like your residency in a, a hospital in america which so basically that really shortens down your timeline so it really just is it's a numbers game there you need to see how much time is spent in which country and what really works for you what i have really seen most people do at least indians do is either to the caribbean island uh, island route or uh, go to the uk island area or or just study you know as we said uh, do your uh, you know just the basic uh, medical stuff in india and then specialize outside right uh, but to be honest i mean another thing just a uh, disclaimer i mean i not i personally and not i don't think other people on the panel have pursued that path so it would be best answered by someone who is gone through like paths like that so uh yeah, just keep that in mind like take our advice with caution on this this is just stuff that we seen appears to right right and you can always uh, you know log on to unilai.com and speak with an advisor who has gone down this path uh before uh the next question we had is uh, for uh, hrithwik how can i solidify uh, my admission in university of waterloo especially in the cs program so i mean what do you think stand out when applying to canada right so i think um great well marks are i think really important um uh, i think that's what helped me get a really good scholarship as well so if you're looking for a financial aid as well um a lot of universities offer that in pay on the basis of your great well marks and i think other than that it really depends on um i think as chetanya said before uh, that what type of extracurricular activities you've done that directly relate to what program you're actually applying for because um that's something that um the admissions office really takes in into consider- consideration so i think um that's something um that you when you're writing these in your essays or when you're submitting application i think that's something that you should really organize and manage the flow of just because that's the biggest thing i think they will focus on right and, and a last question my chat is really blowing up so and we've re- really finished the panel so we'll just uh, put the questions towards the end uh this is for you mac is a good question can you switch majors uh, at nus sorry can you switch majors at nus like let's say you're doing a particular major and then transition oh uh, yeah for sure uh, so ntu and nus have a very similar application for major change um usually you have to have a very good reason as to why you want to change your major and you should show that demonstrated interest um but it's 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 not uncommon so i feel you can switch majors once you get in but i feel like switching majors between different schools like say if you want to switch from a major uh, from a computer science major to probably a major in linguistics it's going to be harder for you to justify that so um i feel like if if you're changing within the same college say if you're changing from a computer science to a mechanical engineering that would be a little easier than switching from uh the college of engineering to the college of humanities but it's it's not uncommon you still can give a really good reason and you still can try and apply for a major change so it it's it's not impossible right so just like in the us i think it's very easy to change your major within a particular discipline let's say you know any business major transitioning into a different business major uh you know an engineering major student transitioning into like a different engineering stream so but, but within colleges i'm assuming it's it's kind of difficult because you need to satisfy the prerequisites for those for that yeah. particular university you know, college yeah yeah right uh okay moving on to the next uh, set of questions uh uh ratna i had this question for you actually uh, how important do you think uh, our standardized testing when you're applying to uk you know so apart from ielts and toefl i'm talking about let's say sats as levels ap's and so on and so forth uh to be very honest with you i had i didn't take a single standardized standardized test when i applied to the uk because it was just not necessary 
a necessity. Um, I spoke to someone from uh, most, I think, all the universities, and I said that, you know, let's assume that I did take the test, right? And if my application goes in, would it look as if, you know, would it be impressive to see that, you know, this guy has just taken the test, he's done well. And they said that, no, not really. They're not, they're just going to uh, just think of it as if they're going to keep a blank paper on it. That's what the UCL rep said, right? Um, and I just, that just led me to believe that I didn't want to take it, right? And I, I do remember speaking to other universities as well. Like, I think I spoke to SOAS and St. Andrews and they said that it's not necessary for you to take it because we don't consider it. Um, again, this is for politics. When I say this, I mean for politics and international relations. I am not sure of any other uh you know uh any other any other course that requires you to take other standardized and other kind of standardized tests um but yes at least for politics and ir and history i can tell you that this was not necessary right so 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 don't even take ielts or toefl no so ielts yes ielts is ielts is a necessity because um at the end of the day ielts is also important for you to get your visa right uh your uk visa because they're not going to, they're not going to give it to you unless you have because i still remember when i went for my visa appointment they said where's your ielts score sheet right so um they didn't do need that as well for the visas so make sure you have that but yes university also wants ielts yeah and actually uh that's a very good point that's because parents and students don't usually think of ielts uh to be a requirement for visa you know for, uh, so just to our uh uh participants here there are a lot of countries that don't, a lot of universities that, that don't require IELTS and TOEFL, but to get into a country, get a visa for a country for, uh, in, in the EU or uh, in the West Coast or even in Singapore, you need uh, some kind of English proficiency test. Otherwise, they're not going to let you uh, get your visa. You'll be rejected. So even if your university is saying, don't take it, we don't need it, you will need it once you go to the embassy. So it's, it's, it's usually better to kind of take it beforehand rather than going through the hassle after you're done after you have your admissions letter in hand. Um, uh, Mac, how about US? Uh, how about Singapore? Do you think SAP uh, or the ACP is important while applying to NTU, SMU, or even the NUS? Because I've heard that uh, NUS has kind of made it mandatory for a lot of people from a lot of streams to take the SAP. Is that true? Do you think that's wrong? Uh, so as far as NTU, SMU, SUTD are concerned, uh, they don't really have a requirement of uh, SAT or ACT, it's optional. So you can add it in your supplementary application. NUS uh, has recently made it compulsory for a few countries, but I'm not sure if India is included on that list because up until now uh, for NUS as well, SAT or ACT was also optional. So um, I'm, I'm not very sure about whether uh, India is on the list right now because um, even, even recent applicants that I uh, met uh, they did not give the SAT or ACT. So yeah, I'm, I'm not very sure about NUS, but for the others, it's not a requirement. It's optional. And if you've written it, it's it's always nice to add it in your application. Right, because it kind of shows just some extra, you know, you went the extra mile with some extra academic tests. So on that yeah. note, do you think APs would be important for Singapore? Uh, no, they don't really consider uh, AP scores. Uh, if if you add it in your application, they probably will look at it, but um, I don't think it's a deciding factor in your application. Uh, the main deciding factor would be your 12th grade scores. And um, for NTU and NUS also, they look at, if, if you have written the joint entrance exam, IIT JEE, then they do look at your JEE advanced rank, not your JEE main score. So if you've gotten a good rank in JE advanced, then that boosts your application for uh, NTU or NUS. Right. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, building on that, uh, Kritik, what do you think is important in terms of standardized testing while applying to Canada? A lot of people say SETs, ACTs don't matter, APs don't matter. Is that true? Would that help uh, students get into better universities with better scholarships? Scholarships. What's, what's your take on that? Um, right. So I think, um... I don't think SATs and ACTs matter a lot in Canada because I did give my SATs, but that, that was because I was applying to the US and that's where it really matters a lot. And I think um, I, I did not give my IELTS, but IELTS is one of the biggest things that matters here. So I gave TOEFL just because I was going to the US first and that score was also valid for my admission process here at York. So I think um, that's what really matters. And on basis of scholarship, I think it's usually on um, your grade 12 marks and your projected score, predicted scores as well. And I think in terms of your English proficiency, proficiency you could get a certain amount of scholarships as well. 
Right. Uh, thank you, Ritik. Uh, now, we all know in terms of US, uh, you have to do a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, and you kind of suffice the criteria for most applications in terms of standards testing because US requires SATs, ACTs, uh, I'll still feel that's compulsory. Chaitanya, do you think APs is compulsory? Would you suggest students not to take APs while applying for scholarships? Or And, and if you say yes for APs, then how many APs do you think would someone need to take to get back a good scholarship in the, in the US? Definitely, uh, definitely so. Well, I'll tell you what I had done. So in my scenario, I did not need to take IELTS or TOEFL because I think it was probably because I was pursuing IB or something along those lines. So I wasn't really, uh, needed to do that's why I didn't do any of that. But I did take the ACT and the SAT subject test and I did, I think, three APs. Uh, honestly, uh, from just my experience and what I've seen, I don't think I needed to take APs. I just took them because at the time I thought uh, that would, you know, really help me cover some gaps in my application. I had a little dip in some of my scores after 10th grade. So I thought that might help, but uh, in, in, you know, just retrospect, uh, I don't think AC, uh, APs are really needed when you're applying to other countries from, from my conversations with representatives uh, when they would visit my high school uh, was uh, that, you know, they, they really, a lot of times, uh, you know, they said that uh, if you submit APs, I mean, as, as Ratna said, we just look at it as like another blank sheet of paper. It could be because, I mean, just a uh, heads up, it could be because they were saying that because our school, uh, like careers department was probably asking them to downplay APs because uh, along during my like 12th grade, there was a trend of a lot of people taking the, you know, taking the APs outside of doing the IB curriculum or the IC curriculum. So uh, just from, you know, a broader scope now, I would think if I was applying right now, I would honestly really just focus on my academic scores and getting a decent ACT or SAT, whatever works well for you, and uh, some subject tests if the university needs. But I wouldn't do the APs. Right. Uh, so I would actually differ from Chaitanya on that, uh, especially because I, I feel that APs is important. Uh, as Chaitanya said, if you have a dip in your class 11th or if, if you want to kind of show excellence in one particular stream, like let's say in math or in economics, then APs would matter. And let's say if you're applying for a particular major and you do APs related to that particular major, it kind of tends to you know make you a better candidate than other people who have not taken it. Let's say if there are five candidates with approximately similar kind of activities in high school grades, you've taken APs, that's something extra that you have done. So the, you're a better candidate, you're a safer bet for those clients, uh, for, for the universities, simply because you've gone the extra mile over students who have not. So, uh, but but yeah, I mean, we, we both have different views, but, but to kind of just do your research and choose the best path for yourself rather than, you know, just picking things from us because we chose what, what was best for us. So I did not give my APs. I uh, think I should have because that would have also gotten me college credits. So, you know, one very important thing is, let's say when you give your APs, you kind of suffice some of the math or uh, economics or, uh, you know, related kind of uh, major related uh, kind of classes as well. So you don't need to take them in college. You already get like four or eight credits for that. So that's another suggestion. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah. yeah, I think from that perspective, it's definitely a trust. Uh, I just, yeah, because I did the IP, I got a lot of credits uh, going into my university through that. But if you're doing the ISC, I would definitely recommend, uh, you know, taking the APs or taking like a proficiency exam, whatever your university offers to get through the initial classes. Because from my experience, from what I've seen in engineering, a lot of my friends from India who did the CBSE or ICS uh, or ISC uh, had to take like the beginning math classes uh, or like calculus classes, even though they probably had covered like the first two or three classes in their 11th and 12th grade. Uh, while I like having done the IB, had directly got to start with the second or third class. So, you know, that's one thing where APs can definitely come in handy. And uh, yeah, again, uh, it is it is subjective, whatever feels uh, good to you, because uh, when it comes to universities, it's really hard to give a final answer because at the end, at the end of the day, it's like people evaluating your applications as well. And uh, they don't, from you know what I've seen, generally put like a, a, a formula for you to, you know, just check things off and be like, oh yeah, now I'm definitely in, because whatever you do, like there's, there's never a guarantee uh, when you would apply. Right, right. 
thank you so much, Chaitanya. Uh, next point of discussion: uh, How important are extracurricular activities? So again, I would like to uh, you know just uh, give the mic to anyone who wants to kind of step in and discuss the uh, importance of extracurricular activities in their country. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, sorry, I just want to answer the previous question again. Uh, so I just checked and you do need to write the SAT or SAT if you have taken the state board exams. So if you've taken CBSE or ISC, you do not need to take the SAT or ACT. But you, if you've done any other board like the state board, like your respective state board, then uh, you do need to take the SAT or ACT. So that's for, that's for NUS, right? In Singapore. NUS, uh, NUS NTU. Yeah. Okay. Ahead. Even NTU. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so ex regarding extracurricular activities, Mac, do you want to start? Uh, uh, so you... extracurricular activities really don't have a place in the application for NTU or NUS. Um, but NUS does have a personal statement section. So if you have demonstrated interest in a particular major that you're applying for, then do specify that and make sure that that interest is gotten across uh, to the admission uh, officer. Uh, but other universities like SUTD and SMU, they consider extracurricular activities and they do see um, what, what kind of clubs you're involved in, what kind of leadership positions you've taken and anything relevant that you've done uh, for the major that you're applying. Right, so, so, so for NUS and NTU, you don't even need to submit your resume. I mean, uh, all you need to do is like, uh, no. okay, I see. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, we don't submit. So NTU's application is very straightforward. There's no uh, section to fill in an essay or a personal statement or anything like that. So it's, it's just entering your scores and numbers and that's it. Uh, but they do have a section where uh, if you've taken a gap year, you must explain your reason for taking a gap year. So I feel like that's where I kind of shined. I kind of used that space to specify that, you know, I did an internship, I worked on personal projects, and these are the, these are the apps that I worked on. This, this is the kind of projects that I took. So I guess uh, that kind of helped me to uh, push my application a little bit more. But um, again, uh, it, it just boils down to your uh, 12th grade marks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mac. Uh, Ratna, moving on for UK, uh, do you think academics was, the, was like the end of it? Uh, just like, I mean, in terms of uh, NTU and uh, NUS, or do you think uh, extracurriculars play an important role as well? Um, no, so academics, let's say, plays 80% of the bar, right? At least I can vouch for the universities I've been mentioning, but extracurricular uh, extra activities matter a bit as well. For example, um, I, when I was writing or when I was applying to all to the universities, I had done an internship um, with the Indian Parliament, right? And I tried and I tried to sell, uh, let's say, my experience at the Indian Parliament um, through my SOP, right? About what I learned, what I saw, and I was there during the Triple Talaq Bill, right? So what I saw, how significant it was, right? Um, I was doing other activities like I was writing for a few magazines on um, Indian on the Indian military uh, doctrine. So I tried to sell. I tried to say that you know, and I, I tried to sell my experience from there as well. Uh, basic basics of things like MUNs, right? Um, you know your um, your moot courts, right? Anything where you can prove to them that you know, as a person who wants to study politics and international relations, I have. I am someone who can speak. I am someone who can you know deliver. I am someone who of public speaking um and more importantly what i felt was that what and what i did that worked for me was that i told them that because i have done this in the past i'm going to be coming there and i'm going to be doing a lot of other things as well right because i want to try what university has to offer right and that is exactly what i did right so that is very important like you know use that 20 percent of importance that extracurricular activities has in your application and fill it to the maximum right do not do not think that you know yes academics is important very important in the case of the uk and the top universities in the uk but don't leave the extracurricular gap and uh, you know gap empty right i mean you always need to show your interest in whatever you want to apply for right otherwise there's no point right uh, applying for that yeah. and um sorry could i just add something if you don't mind um you also need to show them that you are an individual outside the classroom right um because when you're studying subjects like these in the uk you have a lot of inter interpersonal um networking that goes on 
the UK is essentially based on networking, right? You have formal events where you're supposed to just go network with people from your industry. So, and you do this a lot of times on behalf of your university. So they need people who are not only excelling in their classroom, but know what they're speaking outside their classroom as well. So they will be looking for individuals who've been doing activities outside the classroom. Right, uh, uh, thank you, Ratna. Chaitanya, moving on to uh, US, how important are extracurricular activities? Would you like to give a weight to it? Uh, you know, like 40%, 30%? Definitely. I think uh, relative to the UK, uh, they play a stronger role. Uh, I know like from the charts that I, I was looking at back in my like application times, uh, it was evident that yeah, uh, extracurriculars play a relatively more important role. So let's say 70 to 75% academics the dress could probably be like uh, your extracurriculars, your, your essay, your uh, letters of recommendation. You know, what it really comes down to is like, yeah, who are you as an individual? But before any of that, I just want to make sure everyone's clear that even though it's relatively more, it's not like it's the biggest factor unless you've won a Nobel Prize or won like an Olympic medal or like uh, Olympiad math or something the extracurricular can only count as much what really needs to be the bedrock of your application is strong grades what the extracurriculars help show is that you are as I, as ratna said as you are an individual outside of the classes that you really involved and if you come to that school you are going to be contributing to the things that they have to offer that you're going to be actively involved and are uh, someone who will take advantage of the things they have to offer and give back to the society so those are the things they they want to see in you, and that's what the extracurriculars are there for. You know, they want to show that you are a human and not just a, a exam taking machine. And outside of that, it's also um, really helpful in yeah showing that you have continued interest in a specific field. And uh, I think yeah, that's pretty much the bigger things when it comes to extracurriculars. So definitely do them. Uh, you know, be involved. Uh, but don't do them just because you're applying. Just you know, actually make that a thing in you that you you do those things uh, outside of classes because you're interested. I mean, it, it shouldn't be like you do them for the heck of it for two years and then when you get to campus, you just studying because trust me, the academic loads, especially like in America, it's really hard. You've got midterms, quizzes, uh, you know, like every other class is like a quiz, deliverables. It's going to be really intense. So what you want to show is like you're someone who can deal with that continued pressure and still do a lot of things outside of that. So that's what it helps with. It helps you seem as a person who can be involved with a lot of stuff. And uh, when it you know when it really comes down to what it really other thing it helps with is is if you got like ten people with like the same grades because you know it's more than likely right you you'd have like ten people hundred people from India applying to the same place with similar grades, like less than a half percent difference, then they would use that as a differentiating factor to see, okay, like this guy got 94% while doing this, this, this. So, but if you're like 80 percent, you won't be compared to the 94 percent because, you know, that person would, uh, in from like a great perspective, from the university perspective, would probably uh, be able to cope up with the academic pressure a little better. So that's the mentality you need to have instead of just being like, yeah, I need to, I'm applying to America, I need to do like 20 things now, I need to open my own NGO, I need to do this, that it doesn't work like that. Right. And I completely agree with Chaitanya on this because uh, uh, I think extracurriculars play a very important role, but focus extracurriculars is what you should be looking at rather than just being all over the place and doing 50 things. It's better to rather focus on your academics and have three or four very unique things that you can write in your essays and uh, kind of just a highlight on a resume along with other, uh, you know, normal things. Because, I mean, if you just look at it, there are 500 school captains from a particular state applying to universities. There are 50,000 school captains from different countries, from different schools applying to universities. So you, you're not the unique one if you're a school captain. Yes, as Chaitanya said, if you've played Olympics, if you've played represented India for Commonwealth, that is something unique and that is something universities would want you and probably give you some kind of bursary or scholarship for but not for something very random, uh, you know, such as being a school captain or uh, a captain for a particular activity. Uh, uh, Ritik, so, you know, could you please like integrate both uh, the importance of essays, like, you know, how, how does uh, essay writing work in terms of Canada? Is an SOP important when you're applying to universities or once you, uh, like, is an SOP important for your visa process? Uh, 
because that that's a little uh, ambiguous for a lot of students right so i think uh in terms of sops i think um every university has a different structure in terms of accepting sop so it really depends on what university you want to go to um and that would actually make a decision for you if you have to write an sop for that or not because um, not every university requires an SOP. And I think in terms of visa processes, you need, do need an SOP. It doesn't have to be as informative as the one you would write for university, but you still need an SOP and um, it still needs to detail um, your exact statement. Like it still, need to, it still needs to detail your exact purposes of going to the um, country and choosing this university and um, stuff like that. So um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And in terms of, um specific in terms of york university you do not need an sop um you just need um a, a leadership profile there's a leadership profile that you have to do and have to submit and um your essays that you have to do and a um, video interview that you have to give before um to make a decision on your application right right uh, uh thank you so much um uh, mac in terms of uh you know, writing your SOP for Singapore, uh, what is something unique, uh, you know, that you wrote in your essays that you think uh, stood out? Like that was something very important. Uh, so I actually uh, kind of modified my common app essay to be used for NUS's SOP. So I felt like, so the common app essay that I wrote uh, kind of, I guess, helped me to get... Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the common app essay that I wrote was I, I. This is something that I'm pretty proud of because I kind of uh, weaved how uh, artistic vision and coding kind of uh, intersects. So um, I kind of uh, reflected on my love for painting and sketching and how I would translate that into uh, technology. So this is this is something that I'm really passionate about, and that's that's what reflected on the essay itself. So I feel that kind of came across the admission officers and um, I did I did get a lot of offers. So I felt like this this was one of the standout uh, part of my application. Um, if, if you would like, I think I can read a bit of it, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine, go for it. Okay, so uh, this, this is like my intro paragraph. Uh, the soft rustle of brush strokes on my canvas is the most primal sound in my life whether it is my mathematics exam or a complex event at school that I need to coordinate as vice head boy. I've always found peace in painting when my mind is cluttered. Every canvas I touch feels like an extension of myself. I concentrate myself in places, spread myself thin across blank spaces and dilute myself with clarity, much like dipping my saturated brush in a pot of clean water. If only I could code with paint. I started painting and sketching when I was three before science even had a role in my life. Since then, everything I see around me becomes inspiration, even the most mundane objects in my home. In a sketch titled, If Dali Could Move, I was absorbed in thought about a robotic project that I was working on, and I kept glaring at the clock. I began by sketching a clock on a blank sheet of paper, and I found that with time, it turned into a compass. It was at this moment that I fully understood my obsession with time and space. My concerns with the technology that would shape the future found their expression in the soft scratches of my pencil against the paper. The title of the sketch references Salvador Dali's famous painting, The Persistence of Memory. And to recall Newton, I believe in standing on the shoulders of giants. So this, this was something that I was quite proud of. And um, I, did, I did get a lot of reviews from, uh, I, I did get it edited by a lot of peers as well as um, teachers as well. So I got glowing reviews about it. So I think this, this is one thing that really stood out in my application and how I kind of weaved art into how I'm, kind of interested in computer science as well. So, yeah. yeah. Actually, that was very beautiful. So you kind of took something you're really passionate about towards mm -hmm. a field, towards a major, like towards an interest that you want to actually apply for because, uh, you know, SOP does not have a defined uh, uh, like boundary, yeah. such as the common app mm -hmm. essay, which actually limits you to a particular topic, uh, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Ratna, how about you? How about, how about UK? How about the SOP for UK? Uh, like could you like talk a little about that like what's the word limit uh what should you write what should you not write when applying to uk right so in terms of the uk 
um, and the SOP, the word limit is extremely short. I think it's 650 words. Um, and I think that comes to 3000 characters or something. Um, but yeah, because it is short, you have to be extremely succinct in what you want to convey to um, the admissions officers. Um, the thing is, and in terms of the SOP, again, as I've I kept, I've kept mentioning this, but again, in terms of the SUV, 80% is academics, 20% is extracurricular activities. Um, what I personally did when it came to my SOP was that I tried to convey my passion for the subjects that I was studying in school. And I was essentially studying history, I had politics, political science, and I had psychology at that time. And um, what I did is, as I said, I just tried to convey my passion for the subjects. And I tried to slide in my extracurricular activities if you see uh, what mac just read out to you he in one of the lines he mentioned that he was vice captain right in school and he very 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 subtly slid that in right um that is a perfect example of what you need to do when it comes to extracurricular activities and you know matching them with your academics right you do not need to write it in bold saying that you know i worked here during the summer i worked there just when you're talking about your subjects what experiences you draw from those subjects and how it helped you work somewhere Right, that is a perfect example. Um, that is exactly what I did as well. And what I want, and as I mentioned in my previous answer, uh, towards the end of the SOP, um, I tried to convey that what is my vision of what I want to be, right? And I tried to align that with um, the motto of the universities, right? There is one shortcoming in terms of the UK is that it has to be one SOP for five universities, right? So you can't let's assume i can't today write that you know i want to come to ucl because ucl is so good and so is good in so and so right because well that sop is also going to go to kings and so as right and they i'm pretty sure not going to prefer seeing ucl's name there so um you have to be very subtle you have to be very careful you have to use very neutral words right okay you cannot hint at anything and um i had a bit of a problem with lsc because i got rejected from lsc and someone wrote back from the admissions team saying that we did not like what you wrote in your SOP, right? And again, when you're right, when you're applying for subjects such as politics and IR, you have to be very careful of what you cover, right? Because I I touched on a nerve, right, with LSC, and they said that you know your political views don't align with ours, right? And I was caught in the blind because of what I wrote. I didn't expect it to be a big deal. It was not. It was half a sentence, right? But still, it is very strict when it comes to issues like this. So just be careful about things like that. Right, right. Thank you so much, Ratna. Uh, and uh, yeah, I did not. I, like, I think I missed the point where uh, where Mac actually uh, said about like you know wrote, wrote about his uh, him being the vice captain. But that's I think that's something that admissions counselors won't miss. So SS is something where you can brag about, but not directly. Rather, uh, you know, like like very subtly, uh, as Ratna said. Uh, Chaitanya, uh, what is the difference between common app essays and university specific essays? And why is it important uh, to kind of, uh, you know, uh, show how you're the perfect fit for a particular university while addressing why specific essays for universities? Definitely. So I think uh, when it comes to just the common app in general, one thing to keep in mind, or like an essays in general, is that it is not your resume. Your resume is separate and the, you know, the university or like the person going through the application gets to see that as well, in most cases at least. So what you need to make sure is that your essays are not just you, you know, repeating stuff that's already listed either in bullet points or whatever format you put them in your uh, resume. And the key difference in with Common App and the Why essay is that both of them at least have to be a narrative, have to, you know, uh, follow like a story and a, a passion. Uh, and uh, what the Common App goes into is, is more personal is, is more about you and the reader like feeling that connect even though he's not able to meet you so that's what the common app essay is about and obviously uh it is like you choose that from a specific set of prompts so uh you know you have but honestly like you can take it in any direction from there like you you choose a prompt but you could speak about uh you know something completely different from someone who chose the same prompt like that's that's how it works but uh, what the why essay is generally about is like you really showing that it's not just another university you've ticked and sending all your stuff to you really know the university and you know like why they want to see why you're really choosing them so you need to have thoroughly researched uh you know what's happening and if you were to get in like what all you do so you need to be literally like be 
uh, aware of your potential experience and talk about that and make the university realize that, you know, how all the things you've done, your uh, extracurricular, everything, you know, how that aligns with the degree you're pursuing and how what they have to offer perfectly fits into that. So it's, it's, it's like, you need to show how all those different things fit like a glove with you. And once you, once the person reading the application sees that fit, I think that's when, you know, it clicks in the head and you know, once they've seen your app, uh, common app, they've, they're able to like visualize the person or their journey and feel a connection and, you know, uh, offer an admission. And I think that's, that's how uh, it works. However, for some universities, they don't really want, when you're talking about like, uh, YSs that are different kinds of YSs, right? There's some YSs about why that university, but there's some YSs like for University of Illinois, it's about why like that kind of engineering, I think is what they'd like, to, like you to talk about. So this is something I specifically remember from like when the University of Illinois representatives came to the school and they were like, we do not want you to talk about uh, why we are great for like the kind of engineering you're applying for, because they're like, we know what we're good at and what we're not. So we don't want you wasting time about why we're a great engineering school like you know they don't want to see that what they want to see is like why you are interested in that kind of engineering and what will you specifically do in that kind of engineering so even though it's a why essay and why engineering essay it's about how you connect yourself with that so that's something i think uh, is important to keep in mind about your universities is like what what are they looking for are they looking for a lot of like you know uh, research done into them or are they looking for research uh, into the program they're offering? So it's it's a different scenario, and I think it's important to keep in mind. Uh, right. Uh, thank you, Chaitanya. And just building on that, uh, the UCs have a separate uh, application. Uh, so we don't, we're not on Common App. We have a separate UC application where you need to write four essays, including a Y UC specific essay. And a few tips that I would like to give to uh, our uh, participants here is that. Uh, don't try to fit in a story, uh, you know, within uh, the question. It is better to write about what you're passionate about and then kind of interlinking that with the topic or, you know, directly addressing the topic. Because I've seen often students writing about, let's say, music and then fitting it into a leadership kind of, you know, uh, topic or uh, a different, totally unrelated topic. So that's one mistake that I think I made. Uh, so please don't do that. Um, second, I don't want to market in a lie, but I think you know, try, trying to address why specific essays. I mean, you have a mentor from Unirali who's going to be talking about the university and is, is going to be connected with you, trying to understand your strengths and your weaknesses that you can incorporate within your essay. So, so yeah, that's uh, like, like a suggestion from me. Uh, moving on uh, to the next uh, slide, uh, scholarships and financial aid. I would like to keep this towards the end. Before this, I would like to speak about uh, the pandemic and I would like our panelists to talk about how uh, pa the pandemic has impacted uh, you know education in your countries so far is it going all remote uh, how difficult is it for international students uh, are they accepting students are they not accepting students so 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 Mac since you're the closest to India uh, you know the, so like what's the immigration like type like uh, in terms of students being accepted into Singapore uh, especially to NTU or any okay so the acceptance uh, among NTU, NUS, and the other unis haven't changed much. Uh, they do; they still do accept students from India. Um, but the thing is, uh, apart from freshmen, if if current students have to go back to India, then the entry approval is not being granted currently. So uh, current students can't go back to India and then come to Singapore. So that's that's one issue. But freshmen are being allowed into Singapore. And um, apart from that, um, remote work is going on. Uh, there is uh, there, there are a few classes that are being held hybrid. So the thing is the pandemic hasn't really affected NTU's education per se because um, much before much before COVID-19 itself, they started this online uh, type of learning where they did a flipped classroom. Uh, format, which is where you do most of your learning online through modules and courses, and then you go to classes mainly for tutorials and uh, labs. So in that way, the pandemic hasn't really affected our education much, because um, only in the last semester when uh, Singapore's situation was quite bad, 
that's when they uh, converted the labs and the tutorials to an online format. But otherwise, the situation is pretty under control. So uh, they, they're still allowing uh, students to attend in-person classes with appropriate safe management measures. So um, Singapore has taken uh, their safe management measures very, very strictly, and it's been very effective. So um, I think that the education hasn't been impacted uh, as much. So, yeah. So, I mean, if, if I'm a student uh, flying in from India, like an international yeah. student, do I have to quarantine for 14, 15 days? Do I need yes. to be regularly test? Like, like, what's the strategy like? Yes. So anybody who enters uh, Singapore, uh, except for select few countries, has to quarantine for 14 days. And uh, they did have a requirement in the past few weeks where you have to complete a 14-day quarantine as well as a seven-day stay-home notice. So that was what the requirements were. But now uh, it's been changed back to just 14 days. So if, if a freshman were to arrive from India, they would have to uh, quarantine for 14 days in a dedicated uh, quarantine facility, which generally is one of the hotels over here. So it, it's not bad at all. Uh, the only thing that you don't get to do is go outside. Your meals are delivered to you and you've been given everything. So uh, it's it's pretty comfortable, I would say. Right. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, Hrithvik, what about uh, in Canada? Like how has COVID-19 impacted the education at universities in Canada? And uh, would you like to give some tips to the new applicants that they should not focus on standardized testing, uh, rather, you know, like uh, extracurriculars or like what's your take on that? Right. So I think um, in terms of impact on education, it's been pretty much similar to, I think, every other university um, because uh, most universities have gone online and um, all their coursework is remote. So I think the biggest thing is, um, so I think there's two aspects. So if you're studying from India, then it would be kind of difficult because classes would be like at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the night, and that would be hard in terms of managing your sleep schedule, your uh, other responsibilities you have or other things that you have to do in the day, I think. But I think, um, to be honest, I think it's made education easier just because I think an important part is that um, sometimes when you're living on campus, you do have a certain amount of commute that you have to go to the campus. And then um, it's become easier because you don't have to do that commute. You can just wake up, um, do your education, do your classes online and um it's also i think it's easier to connect with other people just because everyone's on the same zoom chat and um everyone has their video videos on so it's easier to connect with different people but of course you lack that personal aspect in terms of um i think um that personal aspect in terms of uh, i think Hrithik, you froze okay no no worries i think uh, we'll wait for Hrithik to reconnect before uh I think Ruthwick, uh, Chaitanya, would you like to talk about? Uh, uh, okay, Ruthwick, you're back. I think you're supposed to be back. Yeah. yeah oh, I, I, I could hear everyone, but oh, okay, okay, that's okay. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, I think the most important thing that has been impacted is like the social life that you would have in your universities, uh, making friends, um, if you're living on residence, um, um, being involved in residence activities, um, being involved or doing a work study position, which I did um, at my university. I think that's what has been impacted the most. And I think in terms of um, tips to applicants, I think um, I think what Mac mentioned um, in terms of um, people not being allowed into Canada, because right now um, um, flights are banned from India to Canada, so you cannot actually um, travel to Canada right now. So that's banned until the end of, I think, late September-ish. So um, I think in terms of tips, it would just be... Um, you have to be vaccinated when you have to be on campus. So you have to be double vaxxed when you're, um, say, entering your freshman year, uh, either in January or in September. So I think uh, in terms of safety, I think um, specific to my university, um, the safety guidelines have been um, really like strong in, in terms of um, making sure that everyone's tested properly before they come to campus. Even classes, I think, has been, um, the guidelines have been updated regularly in, um, in addition to, I think, the provincial guidelines that the state has. So I think um, um, I think it's pretty pretty safe in terms of um, attending in-person university. And um, of course, universities have plans for people who want to do it in person and they do op offer a hybrid option. So I think it's pretty flexible. And I think um, 
that will make it easier for people to attend universities in Canada from different countries, even if they don't want to actually travel to Canada. Right. So, so are the classes uh, happening in person now as well? I mean, can you choose hybrid or is it going to start from fall onwards? Right. So I think fall onwards, um, you could either choose, you could, it's 50% in person. So you could either choose if you want to attend it hybrid or you can go in person. But um, winter onwards, they said that they want to make sure that people are coming to campus so that um, they don't miss that actual university experience. And also classes can be done um, in a safer manner and learning can be more helpful for these students. So it's going 100% um, in person. But the biggest thing is that you have to be double vaxxed even if you just want to enter the university or the campus in general. Right. And, and before moving on to Ratna, I think uh, I'll take a quick two second note for everyone. Please don't message the panelists. Uh, keep your questions towards the end. We are going to wait for your questions where you can ask uh, our panelists. You can address them directly, uh, you know, and ask for their help. Uh, so I have 184 messages, private messages. I think uh, I can't possibly address every single thing right now. So please wait towards the end. Uh, Ratna, uh, moving on, how has COVID-19 impacted the UK? Is there a travel ban uh, just like Canada as well? Or uh, what's the situation like? Um, it's, yeah, and it's a very important question because uh, the situation changed last Thursday. Um, the UK has something known as a red list, an amber list, a yellow list, and a green list, right? India was right up there in the red list. They just moved it to amber list for diplomatic reasons. That means you can now travel to the UK with just home quarantine. So you just have to stay in for 10 days, after which you are free to go out wherever you want. In terms of restrictions, there are no restrictions. There's no social distancing. You don't need to wear masks. Everything is done for in the UK. Um, in terms of university education, uh, and I think the U so the thing with universities in the UK is that it's a centralized decision-making process within parliament, right? So what I've, what the new guidelines is that they want everyone at university in September. That means that if you are not at university in September, you have to take a gap year. Like you will have to sit a year out, right? So uh, it is absolutely compulsory, at least now, I'm sure for UCL, because they sent us a mail saying that they want everyone there. You don't have an option for hybrid class, so they want everyone there in person. Um, that also applies for courses which have up to 800 people in them, right? Um, so they are going to be doing, so what I've heard is that they're going to be dividing classes which are that big into different lecture halls, but people are still going to be physically present there for, in, to, in order to interact with each other. Um, is there anything else that you want me to cover? Yeah. Uh, in yeah. So, so like, like in terms of the Delta and the Delta plus variant, like, especially for UK. So it, right. is there no, no guidelines as to you have to be vaccinated even before you come to campus or like, uh, yes, yes. That, that's a very important question. Thank you. Um, so the UK is moving forward and probably will establish a system called a vaccine passport, right? And the vaccine passport, essentially, um, if you, let's assume you're from, if you're from India, right? Um, India has the COVID shield vaccine um, and that is permissible in the UK. So that's what the government is going to do, that they're going to recognize vaccines as permissible and non-permissible. So the Sputnik vaccine, for example, UCL is not going to recognize it as permissible. So if you have the Sputnik vaccine, there are going to be certain complications you'll have to deal with in terms of filling out paperwork and stuff. But if you have COVID shield, which is a copy of the AstraZeneca, it's a green light for you. If you have that, you can come to campus, right? If you have the Pfizer, you can come to campus. If you have any other vaccine that is basically recognized by the European Union and the UK government, you can come to campus. It is a very simple system. The only complications come in if you use the Russian variants and uh, uh, the Chinese vaccines, right? That's what I, that's what the mail, the official email says to us students right now. But um, there is no there is no set procedure for the vaccine passport right now. So all I want to say is that expect something along these lines in the next six months, right? And it is even though the UK has done away with almost all restrictions right now, uh, please expect that there's going to be some kind of some kind of breakdown in the sense that um, they're going to be very strict with their borders in the next six months. Right. Uh, thank you, Ratna. Uh, moving on uh, to the US, uh, Chaitanya, uh, you know, like a lot of people aspire to study in the US. Uh, what are the COVID guidelines? Uh, would you recommend people applying to the US? Because, you know, most applicants right now uh, who are uh, on this Zoom are applying this year, so they're going to get to the campus next year. So uh, would you ask them to take a gap year, you know, probably hold off their application, or would you say just apply? 
Uh, definitely. I think uh, the U.S. has definitely had a very interesting response, to say the least, to uh, coronavirus and how things have been going with that. Um, from for in terms of travel, I think what I've seen pretty much on an F1 visa, you can come in and, and go. Uh, and it's been pretty relaxed in that sense. I think for traveling outside of India, uh, all I had to get done uh, was just get a test done. And then while coming back as well, uh, that's all that was needed. So now to answer your question more directly, I think uh, it, it is a very personal choice depending on where you're applying. Uh, I think you, UIUC has had a very like amazing response to uh, the virus and how they handled everything. Being an engineering school, you can't do everything online. You need to have the labs and stuff in person. So uh, yeah, and, and I think going ahead, what they have in mind is pretty much most things happening in person, but the Delta variant has, has been causing a lot of uh, new concerns, uh, that's for sure. So with America, I think uh, in terms of how uh, coronavirus is being handled, people need to see uh, it as more of a federal issue. So you need to look at states separately. And then in states, you need to be looking at how, how is the school that you want to go to is looking at it. If it's all being virtual, uh, in, and this is not my advice to you, this is what probably would I have, what I would have done is if everything was virtual and I was starting school, I would probably wait because I think uh, the university experience is much better for you when you're actually going there. Because uh, from my experience, like, you know, one of the reasons I was going was to network and build connections and to understand how things work. And I, I think uh, being online has a huge limitation to that. You can definitely build off of things once you've already set a good base being in person. So that's, that's, and, uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, people can be really proactive with, you know, virtual networking, but all or, or other things that come with being virtual, but this is a lot to do with serendipity and, you know, just uh, the chance of running into people and other things that happen, uh, the bonds that are built being in person. So I would say it is really subjective, but uh, just try to look at what the university is looking at, how they have responded to COVID-19. Uh, you know, are they doing rapid testing? Are they safe? I mean, at the end of the day, you want to be alive and well, right? So uh, just try to look into those considerations as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's the bigger thing. Is there anything specific I'm missing there? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so the second question is actually primarily for the US. Like, do you think uh, uh, in terms of standardized testing, they'll be a little more relaxed uh, because of COVID-19? Because uh, SAP- I have. Yeah. I have been seeing uh, that with some universities, at least uh, uh, with the past few uh, months, which were really intense with COVID, I think standardized testing was definitely affected. So a lot of them uh, became optional and actually some of them straight out uh, started like not listing at, as something you can even submit to the university. So it's again subjective. So I think the first step is really thinking through why you're applying, um, then looking at uh, which country suits best and then which university. And once you've gone to that level, then looking at what that university really wants, you know, is, is are they accepting or not? I know some big universities have stopped all the way, like for for instance, for like master's degrees, like graduate school, MIT is not taking in GRE at all this year, but Stanford has made it optional for some degrees, for some, uh, you know, majors uh, while, while they made it necessary for some. So it really needs, is a very specific thing. So or do your research uh, or you know get uh, get in touch with someone who can uh, walk you through that well, I, I completely agree with Chaitanya and I kind of uh, would like to build on that I believe that if, that if a university is giving you a spot to provide something then it should be there if it, even if it's saying optional SAT is optional EP is optional but there is a box where you can submit your score that means it's going to be looked looked upon it's not going to be just a blank piece of paper uh, otherwise they would have just not had it on their uh, application portal, if, if that was the case uh, for US. So finally, before we uh, move on to the questions, uh, direct questions, uh, you know, I would like all of you to share like one unique experience from the uh, from your university or from your country uh, uh, so far. And I mean, I'll, I'll start. I'll take the back, uh, back and first. So uh, it was my freshman year. I it was winter quarter. It was really cold, uh, like four five degrees. I was biking uh, to campus. Uh, I was running late for class. Right outside my class, I saw a parking spot. There was someone else who was about to park. I quickly, like, you know, biked fast and put my uh, bike in the rack. 
I entered the class, took the seat. Luckily, the professor was not there. Uh, three minutes later, the same guy who, whose parking spot I stole walks in the class, goes to the podium, says, hello, everyone. I am Professor Max. And I'm like, okay, wasn't he like, isn't he supposed to be like 19 or 20? Because that's what he was looking like. And, I, and then he says that, well, I finished my undergraduate degree when I was 17. And now I'm an assistant professor at this university uh, while pursuing my master's. So you're going to be meeting such amazing people. You don't like age is just a number when you, when you're in terms of like education or in terms of even experience, because uh, that was something very unique. And I had never expected someone who's my age to be a professor. I felt like a useless fellow. You know, I was like, what am I doing? So yeah. uh, anyone else with some unique experience, uh, just go for it. Sure, uh, I could I could go ahead here. So I think uh, uh, I've had a wide range of experiences that have been really enriching and have made the last three years and you know going into the fourth year really memorable. Uh, one thing that I really liked uh, was this opportunity I got called the Startup City Scholars Program that my university was doing, where they partnered up with the University of Chicago. So the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana Champaign, is like two two and a half hours away. So like close to uh, 170 miles from this main city of Chicago. And they partnered up with uh, the University of Chicago to do this program where they had a center in like the main city like Chicago. And we were basically as part of the program taking classes both at the University of Illinois and like at the University of Chicago. So as part of that program, uh, it was basically for me to like develop my startup in conjunction with students at the University of Chicago, which I partnered with. Now, doing that, what really was amazing was uh, one of the people like who was leading the entrepreneurship center. Uh, she asked me to reach out to one of the professors in the MBA program because he was really looking in the energy space where my venture is. And when I went to talk to him, he was teaching a class in something similar, which I was talking to him about. And he really just asked me to sit in and like attend MBA classes with him. And I was literally like as as an 18, 19 year old sitting in with 28 to 30 year old people doing MBA classes and experience I never thought I would have. And, you know, that, that was super like enriching and that one entire, uh, like two quarters that happened there, it, it just, it was phenomenal. Like, you know, being in that environment while also going down into the city to do my engineering degree and do like this business stuff on the side, it was phenomenal. And what, uh, really came out of that, which put a, you know, uh, start to that entire experience was that. I ended up uh, getting my name in Chicago's 25 under 25 that year. So that really, you know, that entire experience, which I never thought, which just happened out of luck. Like that was the first year the university was doing that and getting to do that. I think it, it's probably one of the most memorable things that have come out to me, uh, come out for me so far. Um, right. Someone else. Uh, yeah. Ratna, go for it. Um, so mine wasn't an academic experience as such, but it was kind of a funny story. I was at an event and it was a formal event. I was wearing a tie from my school, which was yellow and navy blue in color. And it really stands out in a room. Um, and this old, really old gentleman comes up to me and uh, he starts asking me about the stamp and everything. And I started explaining and then we got talking. I didn't know who he was. Uh, I sat down in my place and I realized that it was Lord Foster who was supposed to be giving the talk, right? And um, so I, when I was sharing my experiences, I really didn't hold myself back, you know? And uh, after the talk, he says that, you know, um, he, he calls me out from across the room and he says that, come, let's have a chat, right? So he takes me out um, for dinner. And this was happening in the Great Hall at the British Parliament, the talk. And um, then he says that, would you like to take a tour of the parliament, right? So obviously I'm not going to say no. And then after that, he said, would you like to go to the pub? You know, the parliament pub, I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, let's go. And I didn't, I did, it didn't come to me that time, but that was the day the queen had dissolved parliament. And I entered the pub and I see the prime minister on my left side. I see Rishi Sunak, the chancellor on my left, right? So essentially the entire house of commons was standing there. And I really found myself between probably the most powerful men in the world, and didn't know how to react and couldn't believe the fact that, you know, I was standing with Lord Foster sharing my academics as well as other experiences at the British Parliamentary pub, right? So that was one thing that really stood out. And essentially my encounter with those gentlemen there led me to get a lot of opportunities because they reminded, they remembered who I was. And um, I got a, a, a voluntary work experience at Parliament because of that, so. 
Uh, that's like one of the, I think, and that's the, a very memorable event, I'm sure. I mean, for the for the few coming years of your life, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I, I probably forgot. I have forgotten what the event was about. I remember the experience more. So. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, anyone would be overwhelmed, you know, like, to be in your situation. Um, someone else, uh, experience. Yeah, I should, I should like, go for it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think mine's not academic as well, but it's kind of a funny story as well. But um, so one of my best friends in university actually um, started a new club and it was focused towards networking opportunities for Pan-Asian students, which I thought was really insightful and really interesting because she was really passionate about it. And uh, in the first year, she was having trouble finding an executive team. And because I had worked with her before in different clubs, different projects as well, um, she said, oh, why don't you join um, my club and like, become part of the events team? And I was like, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm interested in the events team because I really want to gain experience in something related to finance. And then she said, oh, you could just do it for fun and um, you'll have a good time meeting new people because that's something that I really enjoy. So um, I signed up, but um, because of that, that led to a really great experience in terms of um, me being able to connect with people um, like at a, like C-level executives in like the biggest banks in Canada. And I was also given the opportunity to just go and um, visit these banks headquarters, visit their new um their new offices that they've made at different departments, different divisions, and network in general as well. So I think um, it's just something that I didn't think I would get um, specifically from, I think, an events perspective, because I just thought that was really niche and that was just really involved um, in terms of the logistics and everything. But uh, because of that, um, because I didn't say no and because I signed up, I think um, sometimes like really small experiences can give you like really big benefits at the end. And um, also in terms of, I think, the technological side of banking industry, that's something that I really didn't know about and um, had really little exposure to. And I think that's something that really fascinated me to actually change my major from um, um, marketing to finance. And I think, um, yeah, that was a really big experience from, I think, a two minute phone call that started it. So that was really interesting. Right, uh, uh, Mac, uh, any stories? Yeah. From, yeah. Uh, actually, mine's not even academic or unique. It's it's quite funny to be very honest. Um, so it, this was this happened actually last year, and um, I went to one of my elective classes, and I sat down. I really didn't pay attention in the class because I was, it it was in the first two weeks of uh, uni, and um, the first two weeks usually is meant to like add your courses, drop your courses, and it's it's kind of very competitive to get courses at that time because a lot of people log on at the same time. So I just sat in the class and, and uh, I was just doing this. So I wasn't really hearing what was going on. And um, so that that same night I was going outside campus and I met the prof in the MRT. And I was like, oh my God, prof, uh, I took your class today and everything. So then once I, once I met him and he said, all right, just, you know, why don't you just come for uh, dinner with me? Cause I'm going quite nearby. And then he was like, I usually do this with my students. Uh, I take them out for dinners and everything. So I was like, okay, fine. Let me, let me just go tag along. And when we went there, actually, I realized that uh, I had sat in the wrong class and taken a different module. So uh, it wasn't something that I uh, had taken initially. So then I explained to the prof and I was like, oh my God, I took the wrong module. Uh, then he, he told me the model that he was teaching and everything. Then after that, I actually went back and then I changed my module and took the module that he uh, was teaching. Um, so I've, I actually built a really good relationship with that prof and he's been really helpful. He supervised my undergraduate research and he, he was quite helpful with that as well. Um, this year I'm again taking his course. And um, so we had our first class last week and he started with this example and he said that this guy sat in the wrong class. So make sure that you're not in the wrong class today and make sure you're in the correct course code. So yeah, that's one of the funny things that happened to me. Right, I mean, yeah. And I actually it happens like, I mean, it's not unique. Like it's not something that happens to a lot of people, but but I have been in the same spot where I you know, sat in the wrong class and I'm like, I am realizing, okay, is this the right classroom? Because this does not look like econ. It's probably like, you know, data science or some different class. So yeah, but that, that was, quite an interesting story thank you everyone for sharing uh so one thing that i would like to you know br bring up to like one thing 
similar in all these stories is that people everywhere are very welcoming people everywhere are ready to help you you just need to take the initiative to talk to them and build kind of a personal relation because you never know what will help where i mean i have been in touch with my professors and some professors you know whenever i need funding or any kind of uh uh like advice they're always ready to help and i have people on my facebook as well i mean you don't imagine phds from mit or harvard or even from like uh, prestigious institutions being on your facebook unless and until you actually you know go and interact with them and they are very very open and very welcoming so whatever you have heard in terms of any country any racism i think it's all wrong uh, because if you are proactive and you are you know you're you're someone who is taking the initiative to talk there's there's no one who's going to shut you down because everyone likes to share today i mean so that brings up to the conclusion where you should ask us questions because we want you to ask you we want you to ask us questions so that we can share more uh, you know about our experiences and how you should go about uh, tackling your university application so just write me and uh, you know we'll just go in like an orderly fashion so uh, who wants to ask the first question and you can address them to you know panelists directly Okay, uh, Stella, uh, go for it. Okay, so yeah, I had this question. I am in class eleven right now, and I have PCMB, and but I don't have computer science. So if I want to do a course in computer science, do I need to have it in class eleven? Um, are you addressing it to a particular panelist from a particular country, or is it an open-ended question? A uh, US, maybe US or Canada. Um, uh, Chetanya, uh, Rithik. uh so from uh, you know just my experiences i think it is not necessary to have it uh but it might uh might help uh that that's what i i, I think i know i think just having uh sciences is what matters uh they don't necessarily need it but i think if you're actually going to go apply into it it might really help to start uh you know doing it now right mm, yeah uh good thing uh do you have a different take on this yeah i think in um um yeah i don't think it's necessary as tanya said but i think um you could show initiative in terms of taking online courses um and taking i don't know udemy course or courses and just showing initiative i think that would look really good on your application as well and that would actually give you some insight in terms of what you're actually going to go study in university so um yeah that would be my i think take on it okay. yeah i mean uh, i Uh, i think i i'd like to tell us so sorry sorry to cut you i think I, i'd like to suggest you a few things so uh it does not matter if you've taken computer science at a high school level because they don't expect you to know everything but it, it's always nice to have some languages you know like, like as it was suggested take some online courses learn some languages and code related activities show some interest in that particular mm-hmm. field otherwise you can't justify why you're applying for computer science okay one last thing one last thing i'll just okay. add to that is still just look at the university you've chosen and if they need it and then make a decision because okay. uh, you you don't want to be in a position 2 years from now, one one and a half years from now when you like damn it like my top choice needs me to have this and i haven't chosen it so just just be cautious okay and one more question uh, so like um i don't know about the majors and options there but is there something where i can study both physics and computer science yeah a lot of uh, universities in the america at least uh, they let you uh, do like a dual major specifically university of illinois like all the time i see people doing astrophysics and or like physics and cs so like it's pretty common uh, they they have like a whole department focused on that so yeah it is possible yeah and i think even okay. mechatronics falls under the same uh, banner if i'm not wrong uh does that answer your doubts sala yeah yeah thank you so much perfect uh, uh harsh uh, you're up next uh, i mean if you can just type out a question if you don't want to uh speak uh so till then we uh, adi are you here would you like to go next yeah of course thank you um Well, my basically question is from Mac because since he's studying in NTU and I want to pursue for NUS. Uh, actually, I'm currently in my twelfth grade and I've taken non-medical. 
and I want to go for a major in applied sciences and a minor in economics. My, my basic question right right now is that uh, what does NUS offers some kind of scholarships and how much can that scholarship help me in the financial aid? Because uh, that is a very important topic for me uh, because I'm trying to apply for Singapore. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so NTU, NUS, uh, SMU all fall under the Ministry of Education and they have uh, an MOE uh, tuition grant, which is given to students who apply for it. Uh, if you if you do apply to this uh, scheme called the tuition grant, uh, you get up to twenty thousand uh, dollars discounted off your tuition fees annually. Um, apart from that, you can apply for additional scholarships. So there are school specific scholarships, there are major specific scholarships, and there are uh, also hall of residence specific uh, scholarships. So uh, it it varies, the amount varies, and some of them even cover cover up to 100% of your um, entire tuition fees. So uh, there is no dearth of scholarships. You just have to apply for it. However, there is a catch. Uh, if you do end up applying for the tuition grant, uh, depending on the amount that you decide to take from the MOE, uh, you would have to either sign a bond for three years or six years. You would either have to work in Singapore for three years or six years. So um, that's... Uh, how the tuition grant system works over here. And you can apply to um, additional scholarships only if you've taken the tuition grant scheme. So if you did not apply with the tuition grant scheme initially, then you will not be able to apply for scholarships later on in any year of your course. So once you once you apply for the tuition grant, then you can apply for additional scholarships at any point of time. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, one last thing. The this will also depend on my grades, right? Yes, yes. Uh, of course. It depends on your grades. And for scholarship applications, they do consider your leadership potential. They do consider your co-curriculars. They don't say that you need excellent participation or anything like that, but you need to have a good standing. Um, they usually conduct interviews to kind of gauge your interest and gauge how well you do in high school. Yeah. Yeah, that, that answers my queries. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mac. Uh, next question is by Harsh. I think he cannot speak, so he's just typed it out. Uh, my question was related uh, to masters. What are the type of scholarships prevalent in the US for masters in a STEM course, and how do I apply for it? Uh, Chetanya, would, would you be able to answer that? or? Uh... Um, I think I can give you a good uh, pathway to like go and like start digging deeper into it, because Oh, uh, like, you know, none of us from here, like, have done that before. So I think there are a lot of uh, fellowships that exist. So I think uh, what would be a good thing to do is just choosing the, looking at, like, just a broad Google search on the fellowships that exist is what you've got to be doing. There's Knight Hennessy Fellowship, there's Gates Fellow, there's Peeble Fellow. There's a lot of such fellowships that exist. So I think creating a whole list of those things. Uh, would be uh, definitely helpful. And I think uh, the university that you're applying to for your master's, if you go to their website, they would definitely have some uh, specific uh, suggestions there on like, you know, what kind of uh, scholarships or fellowships that they their students uh, generally get. And it, it might be one of those broader scholarships which apply to other universities as well. So you might see like both Stanford or Berkeley or like other, like other private schools or maybe, uh, you know, um, be linked with the Knight Hennessy uh, scholarship. So just take a lot of things out there. Uh, but yeah, there are different paths of getting into it, but that's pretty much what I can help with now. So, so Harsh, I think there's a, uh, Chetan, there's a follow-up question that I would like to answer uh, along with building on what you said. Uh, so Harsh is asking, what is the maximum grant I can get from these scholarships? My simple answer would be, it depends. Depends from scholarship to scholarships, depends from courses to courses, depends from university to university. For internationals, it is very less in comparison uh, to, you know, uh, scholarships uh, given out to domestic students. But yes, there are some. However, I would not recommend you banking on those unless and until you're you doing exceptionally well in academics. And for masters, you also need something exceptional uh, on your resume, like, you know, probably like uh, some kind of internship, some kind of work experience or uh, at least something that stands out in your undergraduate degree that would show your inclination for your specific major. Does that answer your question, Harsh? Oh, 
Okay, I think I, I think it does. Otherwise, you can just post the next question. Uh, uh, Tanish is next. Good evening, everyone. So my question is related to masters. Like, if I want to pursue my masters from USA, will it have any pros and cons if I did my undergrad from US or Canada? I think uh, uh, to to sort of answer that uh, from what I can think of, I don't think it would have that much of a difference. It it definitely uh, might help you uh, to have a similar experience in your undergrad when you're applying to grad school. But you've got a big amount of Indian students, like Indian undergrad students, like who did their undergrad in India, applying to master program in America, and it works out really well. So I think in the end, uh, the master's program really just cares about uh, how well you do. Because after all, if you do your undergrad in America or India, you're still an international student for them. So you fall into that bracket. But uh, what really matters in the end, I think, is how well you score and uh, you know what's your GRE like and what other experiences you have under your belt. Uh, so, so Panesh, if, if I'm not wrong, your question was more related to should I apply for master's or for, or for undergrad? So, uh, so Chaitanya sir basically answered my question, but like I'll ask a follow-up question. So he just mentioned that I'll have to give GRE again. So it's basically the same thing if I go for undergrad in US or pursue my studies anywhere in the world. Yeah, to do your masters, you have to like even in uh, American like citizens. Uh, anyone who's trying to do a master's degree, they have to take the GRE. Like for undergrad, you take the SAT. GRE is, GRE is like the uh, master's equivalent of SAT. So you have to take it regardless. Thank you. That answers my question. Yeah. And uh, uh, or GMAT if you're applying for a business related major. And again, it depends from university to university. For example, data science falls under a business related major at Cornell. So they accept, I think, GMAT, while at Columbia, they accept GRE for the same course. So, so again, it depends. So you need to do your research thoroughly before uh, taking a particular exam and choosing what all courses you are applying for. So again, uh, that's another great point, Tanish, because uh, even majors change from university to university, they differ. So let's say an economics degree might be a managerial economic, ma economics degree in UC Davis might be under the banner of managerial economics degree at a different university, might be under the banner of business studies at a different university. So you kind of tend to uh, look at the curriculum when you're applying so that you don't apply for a different major. I, I, I hope that answers your question, Tanish. Yes, it does. Okay, perfect. Uh, next is uh, Mohit. He's saying, uh, for it's for Ratna Aditya. Uh, how common are unconditional offers from upper middle tier universities in the UK, for example, University of uh, Nottingham, Exeter, Warwick, and uh, Lancaster? Um, okay, so that's a good question. I'm, I'll be completely honest with you. I have never personally come across anyone who has had an unconditional offer. Because um, I think the UK, what it essentially does is universities that they have, they let's assume that they have 100 seats, right? And they give out offers to 150, right? And they essentially bank on the fact that those 50 will not be able to, you know, meet their percentage, right? So to in order to match those numbers, I doubt that they give any unconditional offers, at least at um, an undergrad level, right? At masters, you might have an opportunity where they offer you a straight out place at university, right? Because, I mean, there can be various reasons. At let's if you're doing you're applying for a master's in the same university you did your undergrad with and you, you and you have exceptional grades or like you have exceptional grades and the university trusts you to you know match up to your reputation but in terms of undergrad i have never heard of anyone um but that doesn't mean that there might not be you know uh, a few cases where there might there might have been unconditional offers um but i am not aware of the process behind those offers i and i'm very sure that it's not a similar process as the us uh, I'd like to chime in over here. Uh, I actually received an unconditional offer from the University of Edinburgh, but this was because I finished my 12th grade and I was in my gap year and I had my scores already. So that was probably why they gave me an unconditional offer. So 
I hope. Yeah, so yeah, I'm guessing you had your yeah. scores while you applied for it, right? Your yeah. final scores. Yeah. Yeah, I had my final scores, so that's why they did. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, uh, thank you, Ratna. Thank you, Mac. Um, next question is from Sarthak. I think it's it's for Chaitanya. I'm not good at academics. Can I still apply to Ivy League universities in the US? So that's a very ambiguous question. But would you like to touch on that, Chaitanya? Or okay, I think, I think I'll wait for him. Before that, okay, so I, I'll give the answer for that. Uh, Sarthak, again, it depends because uh, we don't know what your scores are. If it's uh, let's say around anything above uh, 85 or 90 plus, you're good to go. Uh, because academics is not the end of it. You need to also have a standard <laughs> test. You need to have uh, extracurricular activities. You need to have strong essays and strong letter of recommendations. But anything above uh, 85 or 90, you're good to go. You can even apply with a 50, but in terms of getting accepted, I don't think uh, you're going to receive an acceptance unless and until uh, you're an Olympic level player, like Chetana had said, or you've done something exceptionally uh, well for the society, uh, for, for which you'll be like a prestigious student for that ID. For example, Harvard does give out a lot of honorary seats to, uh, you know, people uh, like seasoned entrepreneurs and like people who are very established uh, in their particular field. Um, so I think, does that answer your question, Sartha? And I think we don't have any other questions for now. Uh, if there's anything you, want to say okay so so harsh is saying oh and yes i get uh, the thing about work experience leadership skills and etc required for masters but is having an extracurricular thing important uh mac i think everyone like all of you applied uh, for your undergraduate degree uh, to the us uh, so i mean i think it's pretty similar for masters as well do you think extracurriculars are important when it comes to us uh, why I, I did apply for my undergraduate education, so I'm not very sure about masters, but uh, probably the application process might be similar. Um, yes, I did feel that uh, extracurriculars played a really big role uh, while applying to the US, especially. Um, so I actually did not have a bunch of extracurricular activities, which I just put on uh, in the form. I had like two or three, which kind of stood out. Um, I had like a few that I, uh, I had a few achievements in art. I had a few uh, achievements in coding and I had my leadership experience. So these three were the main things that I highlighted in my application. And I made sure that these stood out. Um, I did have a lot of other extracurriculars, but I did not include them in my application because I didn't feel that they were relevant. So um, whatever leadership experience or uh, extracurricular activities you'd like to include, I feel like these should be like a peak point instead of a horizontal list of things. So uh, maybe some things that you're really passionate about, uh, you have to highlight. So that that's what I feel. But yeah, Chaitanya and the others can go ahead. Yeah, I think Chaitanya stepped out uh, to the restroom. He just texted me. Rithik, would you want to, like, I think you applied to US as well. So uh, would you want to uh, speak about it? Like how important the extracurriculars um, and I mean, especially for masters, because at least I feel that uh, you need to have something in the basket for your related major. Otherwise, why you're pursuing a master's in that? Because it's highly specialized when you talk about masters rather than undergrad. Uh, Ritwik? Uh, yeah, exactly. I think what you mentioned is a great point. I think um, you do need to have a certain amount of, I think, extracurricular activities specific to, I think, what major, you're, what masters you're applying for. Because then it wouldn't make sense if you're applying for that masters. But you don't have any interest in it or you don't have anything that shows that oh um, I have some prior experience in it and I, that's why I want to pursue it or you have a passion in it so I think that's where it matters but I think in other than that I don't think um, it I don't personally I don't think um, and I've also worked with the admissions office here at York before and I personally I don't think it matters it's not the same as it matters for a bachelor's degree because for a master's degree it's there are other requirements that are given higher priority to it um, and I think um, in terms of work experience is something that really matters and work experience in the same field as where you want to do your master's in, I think, uh, would play a um, major role in your application than your extracurricular activities. But your extracurricular activities will make you stand out in terms of having that work experience and also having um, experience um, in terms of uh, niche activities or hobbies or passions that you've done that contribute towards generating your interest 
um, towards that specific master's degree. Uh, thank you, Ritwik. Uh, I think there's a follow-up question from Harsh. Uh, could you please tell me some of the important factors that are required for masters? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's country specific or um, just in general. So I think in terms of just being general, I think um, major, most top schools do require, I think, a certain amount of work experience, but that, do, that, that does differ in terms of um, the major, in terms of the school it is, and in terms of um, other eligibility, eligibility requirements you have. But I think um, other than that, I think it's really dependent on the basis of um, the grades you achieved in your bachelor's degree. I think a little amount of part goes to extracurricular activities as well. And um, other than that, I think um, I think that's those are the biggest things that I can think about as of now. And uh, um, thank you, Ritwik. Uh, there's another question uh, by uh, uh, Sora Deep. Uh, can you please explain the major and minor subject for the undergraduate program? So, uh, oh, okay. Chaitanya, I think that's for yeah, you. Yeah, I could answer that. Uh, so how it really works is your major, like as the name implies, is where most of your class load is. And minor is basically like a much smaller number of classes you do and you get like a minor in something. For instance, uh, like in my program, like my I'm doing a, master, a major in system engineering and design, but a minor in electrical engineering. So for that, I need to just take like 20 to I think 30 something uh, credits worth of classes. So class uh, credits are, is what, you know, uh, how, how most universities in the US work. Every university has a slightly different format, but in general, it's like every class has certain credits associated with it. It's like uh, the heavy intensive class are like four credit hours. The easier ones could be three, two, one. So what a minor is like, you know, you take like six to seven classes, uh, which so seven fours are 20, 30, like around, or probably like if there's some smaller classes, seven to 10 classes, basically. In, in that specific uh, like department. Uh, and they, they, all, they usually have a list of, you know, the kind of classes you need uh, to get to an approved uh, minor. So you basically do that and you take like the small amount and you get the minor. For your major is like what you really go to university for and you pretty much do that over the four years, 120 credits is what UIUC has, 120, 128. And once you complete that, like that's what, your, that's your major focus, like, you know, your broader like what you've done uh does that answer your question or uh, did i like confuse you a little bit so so harsh i'd like to build on what chaitanya said uh and i've said this multiple times to people i've spoken to how the western education system works is that imagine your laptop screen to be a particular university let's say uiuc um the top left corner of your screen would probably be school of engineering top right corner imagine it to be school of business bottom right to be school of arts and sciences bottom left to be probably, let's say, College of Medical Sciences. So a culmination of 15 to 20 schools and colleges make up a university. Now, let's say if you're uh, going to School of Engineering for Mechanical Engineering, it will be very easy for you to do a dual major in, let's say, Mechanical Engineering and Electrical Engineering, or doing a double, uh, like a major and double minor in the same particular uh, college that you're admitted to in UIUC. But when you look at multiple majors and minors between different colleges, and, uh, and schools, it is very important that you suffice every single college's requirement because you kind of take classes at different levels. You take classes at a university level. That means every student studying at UIUC, be him studying English, be him studying rocket science, mechanical engineering, there are some classes called the core curriculum GE classes that everyone needs to take. Then there are some college-related classes that uh, every mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, rocket science student studying in the School of Engineering needs to take and then come your major related classes. And you, you need to do that in four years unless and until you are spending extra time to graduate. So it is very important that you play your cards right and see what courses overlap with multiple majors and minors that you want to do uh, at, uh, at your university. Does that answer uh, your question, Harsh? Okay, perfect. Um, uh, next we have Adi. Um, yeah, um, actually, two questions just popped up in my head again. Uh, question number one is, again, it's to uh, Matt only. Question number one is, uh, I'd be even giving my J-Main. So if I get a good 
rank in that is that also going to help me to get into nus and second question is i got to know that when the students who are studying in the universities in singapore it's e like it's very easy for them to get a part time job especially as a tutor so how true does that statement stand thank you okay uh, thank you for your question um your first question had to do with je mains right uh, so NUS and NTU do not look at JE mains, but they do look at your JE advanced score. So uh, not exactly your score, but your rank. So all India rank. So uh, JE advanced is what matters. JE mains they don't look at. So um, that's that. And for the second question, uh, yes, we do have a lot of part-time jobs available. Um, it may not be just related to your specific field. You can probably take up a a uh, part-time job doing administrative duties or IT work or anything. So um, there are a lot of opportunities. If you'd like to tutor, um, I am not exactly sure what you mean by tutor. If you mean by an academic assistant, then yeah, you would be able to do that as well, but you would have to cert uh, satisfy certain requirements for that. But what you can do is you can take up uh, tutoring for high school students and stuff like that. So that's pretty easy to get. And it's, 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 it's a good source of uh, side income as well for you. So there are quite a lot of opportunities for a part-time job. So just depends on what you're interested in. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that answers it very well. Thank you so much. Uh, I, we have, I think one last question from Mohit uh, and that's uh, addressing to Ratna Uh Are subject-related part-time jobs possible in the UK and available in the UK? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, there's there's a lot of options. Um, so as a student, you can be a researcher for a member of parliament. Like I'm just giving you examples from what I study, right? Um, you could also handle a member of parliament's constituency, run the campaigns. Um, you could also work as a teaching assistant, a research assistant, a tutor for high school students, a researcher for university as a, as a whole. Uh, you can do other jobs also so, so for example in my case i really enjoy food right so i work as a chef at um and, and at night right so uh and plus for example if you're in london you have uh, so many opportunities you don't need to constrain yourself just at university right you can go work for a startup you can go work for any other company right um you have to just get creative and innovative when you're applying for jobs believe me however there is one small issue while working in the uk uh, when you come to university you're essentially on a tier four visa right the visa during term time says that you can only work for 20 hours in a week uh however outside term time you can work for 40 hours 20 hours i know it sounds like it some for some of you it might sound like 20 hours is enough but in the uk you get paid by the hour right so let's assume it's nine pounds by the hour so let's multiply nine into 20, whatever the amount is, it's less for a person who could earn a greater amount working 40 hours. So it's not sufficient. So that's where the problem you one, one faces a problem. Does that answer your question, Mohit? And, and thank you, Ratna. Uh, in terms of US as well, I think you can work. Uh, you can't work off campus because there are no F1 uh, visa. You, you can only work on campus. When you talk about off campus jobs, it will usually uh, need to be approved by uh, the International Student Center and by the university before you can take up that because they don't want you, uh, you know, working at random places because after all, you're here for education, not uh, to earn. And uh, you're not a taxpayer in the US, so that's another problem. That's why they don't let you uh, work off campus. And I'm assuming that's the same for Canada as well, right? That's it. Yeah, so it's the same, uh, but you can work off campus. Um, you can just work 20 hours a week, as uh, Ratna mentioned, and it's the same thing. You cannot work more than that. And, um, in your, um, um, what, like in the summer is when you're not a term student, and that's when you can work 40 hours if you're not doing summer school. Right. Um, thank you so much, Ithpik. And I think uh, that kind of concludes our uh, panel discussion. On um, before we end, just on an ending note, uh, on 29th, we have an IV panel. So I hope to see you guys, uh, see all of you there. And thank you so much to all the panelists uh, for your time. This was very insightful and very helpful. And I uh, hope to see you in future in other panels. Thank you so much. See you guys. Bye bye. Thank you for having us.